I sat on a hard metal chair, its coldness seeping through my uniform. Around me, my squad members, equally weathered and experienced, shuffled in their seats, the sound of fabric against metal punctuating the tense silence. Our commanding officer, a man with a face marked by years of hard decisions, stood at the front. His eyes, usually a stoic grey, twitched with a trace of discomfort. He cleared his throat, his voice resonating off the bare walls. Ladies and gentlemen, he began his tone grave. We're stepping into the unknown, an experiment for a teleportation device, a project cloaked in secrecy, has gone awry. It's resulted in something unprecedented. A rift. He paused, letting the word hang in the air. I felt a chill run down my spine. Rift. It sounded like something out of a science fiction novel, yet here it was. A reality we had to face. It's a gateway to a parallel world. We've sent drones through, the footage shows it's anything but welcoming. Your mission is to enter this rift, gather as much intel as possible and close it. I glanced at my squad. Harrison nodded slightly, his hands clasped tightly. Archer, the youngest and newest member, had a brief flash of fear in her eyes, quickly masked by determination. And then there was Lee, whose steady breathing and calm demeanor never wavered, no matter the mission. The officer continued, The environment is hostile, the inhabitants even more so. You're to proceed with the utmost caution. Your objective is clear. Close the rift and return safely. Are there any questions? Silence reigned. We were soldiers. We knew better than to ask the questions whose answers we feared. Very well. Dismissed. I felt the adrenaline begin its familiar surge, a soldier's response to the call of duty. But beneath it, there was an undercurrent of something else. Something new. Uncertainty. The briefing room emptied, each of us lost in our thoughts about the upcoming mission. The rift awaited, a dark unknown that we were about to face head on. I entered the armory, the heart of our preparation. The walls were lined with racks of weaponry and gear. My squad mates were already there, each at their station, methodically checking their equipment. Harrison was inspecting his rifle, a sleek, matte-black piece of technology far advanced from standard issue. His fingers moved with practiced ease, disassembling and reassembling it with a rhythm born of countless drills. Archer, standing beside the arsenal of grenades and explosives, was methodically attaching them to her tactical vest. The clinks and clatters of metal on metal created a staccato melody as she worked. Despite her initial fear at the briefing, her movements were steady and confident, a sign of her resilience. I moved to my own station, feeling the familiar weight of my body armour as I strapped it on. It was a second skin, moulded to my form from years of service, the ceramic plates and Kevlar mesh a comforting presence. Lee was at the tech station, interfacing with the array of gadgets we would need for this mission. His fingers danced over the holographic displays, setting up communication links and scanning devices, each beep and chirp a part of the technological symphony that would keep us connected and aware in the unknown world of the Rift. Check your gear, folks. No room for error on this one, I called out, my voice firm but calm. The response was a series of affirmatives. The equipment was our lifeline. The HUD heads-up display helmets provided real-time data, night vision and thermal imaging, essential for the unpredictable terrain we would encounter. The weapons were state-of-the-art, capable of rapid fire and equipped with smart targeting systems. Even our boots were specially designed for varied terrain, providing grip and stability. As we equipped ourselves, the reality of the mission sank in deeper, this was no ordinary operation. We were stepping into a world where the rules of physics as we knew them might not apply, where the enemy was unknown and the environment potentially as lethal as any adversary. Remember, stay sharp, stay focused. We watch each other's backs out there, I reminded the team, meeting each of their gazes. In their eyes, I saw the reflection of my own determination. We were ready as much as one could be for a journey into the unknown. Once fully geared, we assembled in formation, 
a unit bound by duty and the unspoken bond forged in the fires of countless missions. Let's move out, I commanded, my voice resonating with the weight of responsibility. The rift stood at the center of the lab, its edges sparkling with indigo light. Scientists and technicians, clad in white lab coats, moved about, their eyes periodically darting to the anomaly that their experiment had birthed. We approached the rift, our boots echoing on the polished floor. The air around the rift vibrated, a silent symphony of disrupted physics and warped space. I could feel a tingling sensation on my skin, like the static charge before a storm. Remember, comms check every five minutes. We don't know how the rift will affect communication, I reminded the squad, my voice steady despite the pounding of my heart. Harrison gave a thumbs up. Archer nodded sharply and Lee simply readied his equipment. One by one, we stepped forward. The sensation was like diving into cold water, a shock to the system followed by an overwhelming rush. For a moment, there was a sense of disorientation, a feeling of being stretched and compressed all at once. Then, just as suddenly, we were through. The world on the other side of the rift bore a distorted resemblance to our own. The lab was there, but it was a twisted version of itself. Walls warped, equipment overgrown with bizarre flora, and the air heavy with a scent that was both metallic and organic. An olfactory contradiction. The light here was different, too. It was dimmer, and the shadows seemed to cling a little longer, a little deeper. The silence was oppressive, broken only by the sound of our own breathing and the soft hum of our equipment. Status report, I called out, my voice sounding alien in this stillness. Harrison here, all green, came the reply. Archer, ready to move, she reported, her youthful voice belying the firmness of a seasoned soldier. Lee, systems functional, he added, his tone as unreadable as ever. We took a moment to orient ourselves, our HUDs fluctuating with data as they tried to map this unknown environment. The lab seemed abandoned, or rather, left to be reclaimed by whatever forces dominated this world. Let's move out, standard formation, eyes peeled, I instructed, leading the way through the twisted corridors. Every step was cautious, deliberate, our senses heightened to their utmost in this alien landscape. We moved with precision, covering each other's backs, our training a comforting constant in an otherwise unpredictable world. The twisted version of the lab was just the beginning. As we ventured out, the landscape before us was a nightmarish distortion of our world. Buildings familiar in their shape were overgrown with peculiar glowing growths. The sky was a mosaic of swirling dark clouds, occasionally brightened by flashes of strange purple lightning. The ground beneath our boots felt unstable, as if the very earth was unsure of its reality. We moved in a tight formation, our senses hyper-alert. The HUDs in our helmets scanned the environment, but the readouts were erratic, as if the technology itself was struggling to make sense of this world. As we navigated through what once might have been a bustling city centre, the silence was suffocating. There were no signs of life, no movement save for our own. Movement! Two o'clock! Harrison's voice cut through the comms, terse and alert. We all snapped into position, weapons ready. Through the dim light we saw them, creatures humanoid but grotesquely misshapen, their skin a pallid, mottled grey. They moved with a jerky, unnatural gait, as if unfamiliar with the act of walking. Their eyes, large and unblinking, reflected the glow of the surroundings. Hold fire, I commanded quietly, watching the creatures. They seemed curious but wary, circling us at a distance. There was an intelligence in their movements, a deliberate caution that suggested awareness and thought. We're not here to engage unless necessary, I reminded the squad. Keep moving. We continued, the creatures shadowing us. The air suddenly shifted, a static charge prickling our skin. A low, guttural sound reverberated through the buildings, a sound that was felt as much as heard. The creatures retreated, vanishing into the shadows with surprising speed. That doesn't sound friendly, 
Archer muttered, her voice tense. We tightened our formation, weapons at the ready as the sound grew louder, closer. It was then that the first of the true inhabitants of this world made their appearance. They were like nothing we had ever seen, towering, insect-like beings, their carapaces gleaming in the dim light. They moved with a terrifying speed and precision, skittering across the walls and ceilings with ease. Engage, I ordered, as one of the beings lunged towards us. The firefight was chaotic, the creatures were fast, their movements erratic and unpredictable. We fired in controlled bursts, the advanced targeting systems of our weapons guiding our shots. But for every creature that fell, it seemed two more took its place. Fall back, I yelled over the din of gunfire and alien screeches. Regroup at the rally point. We retreated, laying down covering fire as we moved. The creatures pursued, but with a hesitation that suggested they were more curious than hostile. We reached a relative safety of a more fortified position, an old building that offered a momentary respite. Our breaths were heavy, the adrenaline coursing through our veins. We're not in Kansas anymore, Harrison quipped, a hint of dark humour in his voice. No, we're not, I replied, catching my breath. But we have a mission. Let's keep moving. The building we had taken refuge in was a dilapidated shadow of its former self, the walls crumbling and overrun with the same growths that seemed omnipresent in this world. We quickly checked our ammunition and gear, ensuring everything was in order for the continued mission. Archer, take point with the scanner. Harrison, cover our six. Lee, keep an eye on the verticals, I instructed, my voice low but clear. We couldn't afford any surprises, not in this world. As we moved out, the cityscape around us seemed to warp and twist. Buildings leaned at impossible angles, streets abruptly ended in sheer drops, and what should have been straight pathways looped back on themselves. Our HUDs were constantly updating, trying to make sense of the geographic anomalies. Archer's scanner beeped intermittently, a dissonant soundtrack to our cautious advance. Multiple life forms detected, varying sizes, some larger than anything we've encountered, she reported. Every shadow could be a hiding place for those insect-like creatures, every corner a potential ambush point. We moved in a tight formation, our training keeping us synchronized despite the alien environment. Suddenly the scanner let out a continuous high-pitched tone. Contact! Multiple vectors! Archer shouted, just as the shadows around us came alive with movement. The creatures were upon us in an instant, a horrifying mix of shapes and sizes, all teeth and claws and gleaming carapaces. We opened fire, the sound deafening in the enclosed space. The creatures were relentless, but our discipline held. We fought as a unit, covering each other, moving back to back. Lee's rifle barked as he took down a creature that had scaled the side of a building, its body falling with a sickening thud. Harrison was a whirlwind of controlled violence, his shots precise and deadly. Archer, despite her earlier fear, fought with a ferocity that belied her youth. But it was not just our weapons that gave us an edge. It was our ability to adapt, to read each other's movements and intentions, honing years of training into these moments of life and death. As quickly as it had begun, the skirmish ended. The creatures, sensing perhaps that we were not prey to be easily taken, retreated into the shadows from which they had emerged. We stood panting, the adrenaline slowly ebbing from our veins, surrounded by the remains of our attackers. We found a semblance of shelter within the ruins of what appeared to be an old municipal building. Its walls, though eroded and covered in the ubiquitous flora, offered a temporary respite from the relentless pursuit of the creatures. We settled into a defensible position, our backs against a wall that felt solid enough to withstand any immediate threat. Status report, I commanded, my voice echoing slightly in the large, desolate space. Green across the board, but ammo's getting low, Harrison reported, methodically checking his rifle. Same here, these things are relentless, Archer added, her eyes scanning the shadows. Lee spoke up. These creatures, they're adapting. Each wave seems to learn from the last. We need to be unpredictable. Change our tactics. His analysis was spot on. 
The creatures were not just mindless predators. There was an intelligence behind their attacks, a learning curve that was quickly shortening. We can't keep going like this, I mused aloud. We need to find a way to close the rift, and fast. But we also need more intel on these creatures, any weaknesses we can exploit. Harrison nodded, his face set in a grim line. We should capture one, alive if possible, study it. The suggestion was met with apprehension. Capturing one of these creatures was a risky proposition, but it was a risk we had to take. We'll set a trap, I decided. Use one of the smaller side streets, limit their approach. Archer, rig some explosives. Non-lethal, we need one alive. Harrison, Lee, you're with me. We'll be the bait. Preparations were made quickly and efficiently. Archer set up the explosives with practiced hands, creating a perimeter around our chosen street. Lee and Harrison took positions on either side, while I stood in the open, the lure for the trap. The wait was tense, every shadow a potential harbinger of another attack. The silence of the city was oppressive. Then they came. The creatures, drawn by my presence, approached with caution, their movements a grotesque ballet of predatory grace. As they entered the kill zone, Archer detonated the explosives, the concussive force stunning the creatures without causing lethal harm. The squad moved with precision, Harrison and Lee subduing the dazed creatures with expertly aimed strikes. In the chaos, one of the smaller creatures was isolated, its movements sluggish from the shockwave. With swift, practiced movements, we secured the creature, its limbs bound, its jaws muzzled. It was still very much alive, but incapacitated. Good work, team, I praised, a sense of accomplishment amidst the chaos. Let's get what we can from this thing and then keep moving. We've got a rift to close. With the captured creature securely in tow, we moved cautiously through the desolate streets. Our senses heightened to every sound and shadow. The city around us seemed to watch with a thousand unseen eyes. Its silence, a haunting spectre. The creature, though bound and muzzled, exuded a low, growling sound. Lee took point in analysing the creature. His observations were clinical and detached, the mark of a seasoned soldier. Notice the skin, scales almost, but softer. It's adaptive, probably for camouflage. Eyes are large, likely night vision capable. We absorbed the information, each detail a potential advantage. Harrison kept a wary eye on our path, while Archer monitored our rear, ensuring no surprises. As we navigated deeper into the center of the city, the architecture became increasingly bizarre. Buildings twisted upon themselves in impossible geometries and streets folded into vertical planes. Suddenly, Archer's voice crackled through the comms, tense and alert. Movement, but it's... odd. Not like the creatures we've encountered. Shadows are moving against the light. We halted, forming a defensive circle. It was then that we noticed it. The shadows were indeed moving independently, slithering along walls and floors with a sinister, liquid grace. Keep tight, watch your sectors, I ordered, my voice steady despite the rising unease. The shadows seemed to be observing us, circling with a curious yet menacing intent. The bound creature began to thrash violently, its guttural sounds turning into high-pitched shrieks. It was reacting to the shadows, a primal fear evident even in its alien demeanour. Something's not right, Harrison murmured, his experienced eyes scanning the undulating darkness. Without warning, the shadows converged. They materialised into solid forms, creatures of darkness, their bodies a swirling mass of smoke and obscurity. They moved swiftly, darting in and out of our line of sight, disorienting in their fluidity. Open fire, I commanded, as the creatures lunged. The firefight was chaotic, our bullets seeming to pass through the shadowy beings with little effect, their forms barely tangible, yet their presence undeniably threatening. Use the light, Lee shouted, a realisation dawning on him. They're weakened by the bioluminescent light. Quickly adapting, we manoeuvred ourselves towards the glowing growths. The creatures recoiled from the light, their forms dissipating upon contact with the luminescence. 
Using this newfound knowledge, we fought back. The creatures, though numerous, were no match for our tactical acumen and adaptability. Slowly but surely, we pushed them back, forcing them into the darkness from which they had emerged. We regrouped. The immediate threat abated. The captured creature had gone silent, its reaction to the shadow beings a clear indication of the complex ecosystem of this parallel world. We need to keep moving, I said, checking our surroundings. These shadow creatures, they're just another part of this world's dangers. We adapt, we survive. The city's streets seem to stretch into infinity, each turn leading to more bewildering and twisted landscapes. Our captured creature had become silent, its earlier thrashing reduced to a resigned stillness. Without warning, the ground beneath us gave way, a cleverly disguised trap. I managed to grab onto a ledge, but Harrison and Archer weren't as lucky. They disappeared into the darkness below with startled cries. Lee and I exchanged a quick, grim look before I nodded, signalling him to stay above as I rappelled down after our fallen squad members. The pit was deep, the walls slick with moisture, and the same luminescent growths that seemed omnipresent. At the bottom I found Harrison and Archer, dazed but alive, in what appeared to be a subterranean tunnel. Report, I said, checking them for injuries. Bit rattled, but no serious damage, Harrison responded, his voice steady despite the fall. Archer nodded in agreement, her eyes scanning the darkness. What is this place? Before I could answer, shadows emerged from the tunnel, materializing into figures. They were humanoid, but distinctly different from the surface dwellers we had encountered. Their tall, gaunt, angular appearance was accompanied by skin that had a chitinous quality, resembling an exoskeleton. They spoke in a series of clicks and guttural tones, a language beyond our understanding. Their movements were deliberate, their postures exuding a sense of authority. We were surrounded, outnumbered, and outgunned. Reluctantly, I signalled for Harrison and Archer to lower their weapons. The beings gestured with their slender arms, herding us through the tunnels. As we walked, the environment changed. The natural, cave-like structures gave way to more constructed spaces, with metallic walls and strange, geometric designs. We were brought to a large hall, where more of these beings milled about. The room was filled with equipment and screens displaying data in an alien script, suggesting a level of technology far beyond what we had anticipated. Our captors communicated among themselves, occasionally gesturing towards us. It was clear we were the subjects of great interest, perhaps the first humans they had encountered. Harrison leaned in, whispering, We need to find a way out. Gather intel and regroup with Lee. I nodded my mind racing with plans of escape. But first, we needed to understand our situation. Observing our surroundings, I noticed that despite their advanced technology, our captors were cautious, keeping a safe distance from us. It suggested curiosity and fear, an angle we could potentially exploit. Our attention was drawn to a new figure entering the hall. Taller and adorned with intricate markings on its carapace, it exuded an air of authority. The room fell silent as it approached us. It spoke, and to our surprise, a device on its body translated its clicks into broken but understandable English. You are not from our world. Why are you here? The question marked the beginning of a tense, cautious dialogue. We explained our mission, careful not to reveal too much. In turn, we learned that these beings, calling themselves the Khan, were the dominant species of this parallel Earth a civilization built underground, away from the dangers of the surface. The meeting ended with us being escorted to a holding area. A cell, effectively, but with basic amenities. Harrison looked at me, his expression resolute. We're not out of this yet, sir. We'll find our way back. Archer nodded in agreement, her demeanor unbroken by our capture. We're still in the game. Just need to find the rules. In that cell, deep within the bowels of an alien civilization, we planned. We were soldiers, trained to adapt, to survive. And we would do just that, for our squad, for our mission, for our world. 
The cell in which we were confined by the Khan was utilitarian, a stark space with metallic walls and a faint, constant hum that resonated through the room. Harrison, Archer and I assessed our situation with the trained eye of soldiers. Every detail could be a key to our escape. We need a distraction, Harrison whispered, his eyes scanning the room for anything we could use. Something to draw their attention. Archer nodded, her gaze settling on the room's only door, a solid slab of alloy with a complex locking mechanism. If we can get one of them inside, I can try to take their weapon. Our conversation was cut short as the door slid open with a hiss. A single Khan entered, carrying what looked like food rations. Its movements were cautious, eyes never leaving us as it placed the tray on the floor and backed away. Now was our chance. As the Khan turned to leave, I feigned a collapse, clutching my chest and groaning loudly. The creature hesitated, its curiosity piqued. Harrison and Archer sprang into action, Harrison moving to assist me while Archer positioned herself near the door. The Khan stepped closer, its attention now fully on me. In a swift, fluid motion, Archer lunged, grappling with the creature. Surprised and unprepared for such aggression, it stumbled and its weapon clattered to the floor. Harrison was there in an instant, securing the weapon and aiming it at the Khan, who raised its arms in a sign of surrender. I sprang up, joining Archer in restraining our captor. Quick, search it for anything useful, I instructed. Archer rummaged through the creature's belongings, finding a small device that looked like a handheld computer. Got something, she said, holding it up. Meanwhile, Harrison kept the Khan at bay with its own weapon. Let's move. We don't have much time before they notice something's wrong. We exited the cell, the Khan bound and forced to lead the way. The corridors of the underground complex were a maze of identical passageways, but the handheld device Archer had acquired provided a rudimentary map. As we navigated through the tunnels, the device beeped, indicating a large room nearby. A quick peek revealed what appeared to be a control center, filled with screens and equipment, possibly our key to understanding more about the rift. Archer, Harrison, watch our friend here. I'm going to see what I can find out, I said, entering the room. The technology was alien, but some concepts are universal. I scanned the screens, looking for anything resembling coordinates or energy readings. It wasn't long before I found what looked like surveillance footage of the rift along with a series of complex calculations and readings. I quickly memorized the location and the data, a potential breakthrough in our mission. Just then, an alarm blared, the sound ringing through the tunnels. They know we're gone. Time to move, I said, rushing out of the room. With the Khan still in tow, we made our way through the corridors, the handheld device guiding us towards the surface. We moved quickly but cautiously, aware that every corner could lead to an encounter with more Karn. The Khan, bound and under our control, was a reluctant guide, but the handheld device Archer had secured proved invaluable, displaying a layout of the complex. Our priority is to regroup with Lee, I stated, leading the way. He'll be our eyes and ears on the surface. Harrison, weapon ready, took point his experienced eyes scanning for any sign of the Khan. Archer, with the device in hand, kept us on course, her focus unwavering despite the mounting tension. The corridors were a jumble of metallic walls and harsh, artificial light. We moved swiftly, our boots echoing against the cold floor. We needed to reach the surface before the Khan organized a coordinated pursuit. As we rounded a corner, a group of Khan appeared, armed and ready. Without hesitation, Harrison opened fire, the captured weapon unleashing a barrage of energy pulses. The Khan were taken by surprise, their numbers quickly dwindling under our assault. Move! I commanded, seizing the moment. We dashed through the chaos, our captive Khan in tow. The path to the surface was a gauntlet of obstacles and enemy encounters. Each skirmish was brief but intense, our training and adaptability giving us the edge despite being in unfamiliar territory. Archer's quick thinking and Harrison's steady aim were invaluable, 
each covering the other in a seamless display of teamwork. Finally, we reached what appeared to be a lift platform, a potential route to the surface. I signalled for Harrison to secure the area while Archer worked on the control panel, her fingers flying over the alien interface. The platform lurched into motion, ascending through a vertical shaft that seemed to stretch endlessly into the darkness above. The tension was a tangible presence among us, each of us on edge, expecting an ambush at any moment. As we emerged onto the surface, the contrast was stark. The oppressive atmosphere of the underground gave way to the stillness of the parallel world cityscape. We were met with the sight of Lee, crouched atop a nearby building, his rifle trained on the lift. Good to see you, sir, he said over the comms, a hint of relief in his voice. Likewise, Lee. We've got intel and a Khan prisoner. We need to move out before they regroup, I replied, assessing our surroundings. The city was as we had left it, a bizarre landscape of twisted structures and glowing flora. But now the threat of pursuit loomed over us, a constant pressure urging us forward. We head to the coordinates I memorized from their control center. It might give us a lead on closing the rift, I informed the squad. Our journey through the alien city towards the coordinates was a tense endeavor. The streets were deserted a ghostly silence pervading the air, broken only by the distant, ominous sounds of the Khan city stirring below. The surreal architecture around us seemed to warp and twist under the dim light, creating a landscape that was both mesmerizing and disorienting. I led the squad with determined strides. Harrison and Lee flanked our formation, their weapons at the ready, scanning for any signs of danger. Archer, clutching the alien device, kept us on course, her expression focused and resolute. As we advanced, the city's bizarre structures gave way to a more open area. In the distance, we could see a structure that stood out starkly against the backdrop of the city, a towering construction that throbbed with a strange energy. That's got to be it, I murmured, eyeing the structure, the heart of their operation. We entered cautiously, our weapons drawn, Inside, the structure was vast and cavernous, filled with alien machinery and screens displaying streams of incomprehensible data. In the centre of the room stood a massive device, its design complex and imposing. It was connected to a series of conduits that extended outwards, disappearing into the walls and ceiling. This has to be related to the rift, Lee observed, his gaze analysing the machinery. Archer approached one of the screens, attempting to interface with it using the handheld device we had acquired. After a moment of concentration, her face lit up. I've got something. It looks like energy readings, similar to what we saw in the control center. Harrison kept watch at the entrance, his demeanor alert. Whatever this is, it's big. They're channeling a lot of power through this thing. I approached the central device. It was then that I noticed a series of markings on the floor forming a circle around the machine. They were unmistakably similar to the symbols we had seen around the rift. This could be it, I said, realization dawning on me. This device might be what's keeping the rift open. If we can shut it down. Our planning was interrupted by the sound of footsteps. We turned to see a group of Khan entering the room, their expressions a mix of surprise and hostility. Leading them was the same figure we had encountered in the underground hall its intricate markings denoting a position of authority. We mean no harm, I announced, stepping forward with my hands raised. We're here to close the rift. It's dangerous for both our worlds. The Khan leader regarded us with its unblinking eyes, then spoke, the translation device converting its clicks and tones. You do not understand the consequences. The rift is a bridge to a power we have sought for generations. A tense standoff ensued, our objectives clashing. It was clear the Khan had their own reasons for keeping the rift open, reasons that could spell disaster for both our worlds. We need to act, Harrison whispered, his hand inching towards his weapon. Harrison subtly positioned himself for optimal cover, his experienced eyes assessing the Khan's positions. Archer, still near the alien console, surreptitiously continued her attempts to interface with the device, her fingers dancing over the controls. The Khan leader, 
sensing our resolve, spoke again, its voice a mechanical translation of clicks and guttural tones. You cannot stop this. The energy from the rift is our future. I locked eyes with the creature, my voice firm. It's a danger. To both of us. We've seen what it can do. We can't let that power be unleashed. A tense silence followed my words. Then, without warning, the Khan leader signalled its troops. The room erupted into chaos. Engage! I shouted. The squad sprang into action with well-rehearsed precision. Harrison opened fire. The captured Khan weapon unleashing bursts of energy, forcing the Khan troops to take cover. Archer, using the distraction, intensified her efforts at the console, her focus absolute amidst the chaos. Lee, with his sharpshooter skills, provided cover fire, each shot precise, buying us valuable time. I joined Harrison in the firefight, moving strategically to flank the Khan forces. The Khan, despite their technological advancement, seemed unprepared for our tactical prowess. They returned fire, their weapons emitting concentrated beams of light, but our training and experience gave us the edge. Amidst the exchange of fire, Archer let out a triumphant shout. I've got it! I think I can shut it down! The room's central device began to emit a high-pitched whine, the lights on its surface shivering. We need to cover Archer, I yelled, focusing our defense around the console. The Khan, realizing their control was slipping, intensified their assault. But we were unyielding, a cohesive unit forged in the fires of countless battles. With a final deft input, Archer triggered the shutdown sequence. The device groaned, a sound of mechanical distress, and the energy began to recede. The room shook, dust and debris falling from the ceiling as the machine powered down. The Khan troops, seeing their objective lost, began to retreat. The leader, however, stayed, its expression unreadable behind its alien features. You do not know what you have done, it said, a tone of defeat in its mechanical voice. We've possibly saved both our worlds, I replied, watching as the last lights on the device dimmed and died. The room was now silent, the only sound our heavy breathing and the distant rumble of the city above. We had done it. The machine, presumably the power source for the rift, was shut down. But our mission was not over yet. We needed to return to the rift site, confirm its closure and find a way back to our world. We move out now, I commanded. Let's finish this. With the device shut down, we swiftly exited the towering structure, our senses heightened for any sign of Khan pursuit or residual dangers. The alien city around us seemed to shudder, as if the deactivation of the machine had sent ripples through its very foundation. Archer led the way, using the handheld device to navigate the convoluted streets back to the rift site. Harrison and Lee flanked our formation, their weapons scanning for threats in the half-light of the world. The city was more active now, stirred into unrest by the events at the Khan's stronghold. We spotted distant figures moving in the shadows, the inhabitants of this world responding to the change in their environment. We need to keep a steady pace, I advised. Stay alert, but avoid unnecessary conflicts. As we moved, the ground beneath us felt increasingly unstable, tremors rippling through the streets. The buildings, already twisted in their architecture, groaned and creaked, as if on the verge of collapse. We've upset the balance here, Lee noted, his voice steady despite the chaos around us. This world is reacting to the shutdown. The route back to the rift was a treacherous one. We encountered pockets of resistance, groups of Khan who were more organized and aggressive than before. It was clear they viewed us as the cause of the disruption to their world. Each confrontation was brief but intense, our squad relying on tight coordination and strategic retreats to avoid becoming bogged down in protracted firefights. Our ammunition was dwindling, and preserving our resources was crucial. Finally, the familiar, distorted landscape of the rift site came into view. The area was in turmoil, the air crackling with displaced energy. 
The rift itself was still there, but its appearance had changed. It was less stable. We need to confirm if it's closing or if we need to do more, I said, approaching the rift with caution. Archer, examining the readings on her device, frowned. The energy levels are fluctuating. It's destabilizing, but I'm not sure it's closing completely. Could the machine have been a stabilizer as well as a power source? Harrison speculated, his gaze fixed on the chaotic portal. It's possible, I conceded. We might have partially closed it, but not entirely. The situation was clear. Our mission was not yet complete. The rift, while destabilized, remained a threat. A tear between worlds that could unravel at any moment. We need to find a way to close it, once and for all, I declared, determination stealing my voice. The area around the rift was a scene of chaos, the ground quaking, and the air filled with alien sounds. The rift itself thrashed like a wild beast, its edges flaring and recoiling erratically. We stood before it, a team united against an unfathomable force, ready for our final stand. Archer, any ideas on how to close this thing for good? I asked, eyeing the unstable portal. She studied the handheld device. If we can overload it with energy, force it to collapse on itself. But we'll need a power source strong enough to do it. Harrison interjected, pointing to the remains of the Khan tech we had encountered. What about using their weapons? Rig them to overload? It was a long shot, but our best chance. We quickly gathered all the Khan energy weapons we could find, setting them up in a makeshift array around the rift. As we worked, the ground shook violently, a sign that this world was coming apart at the seams. We were racing against time, and we knew it. Lee, cover us! Archer, help me with the configuration. Harrison, prep for evacuation, I commanded, my voice cutting through the chaos. Lee took up a position, his sharpshooter skills picking off any Khan that dared approach. Archer and I worked feverishly, jury-rigging the alien weapons to overload and channel their energy into the rift. The rift reacted violently to the influx of energy, its movements becoming more erratic, its howls more deafening. The air was electric, the boundary between the worlds thinning with every passing second. Almost there, Archer yelled over the din. Get ready! Harrison stood by, his eyes fixed on the portal. It's now or never! With a final adjustment, Archer set the overload sequence. We all braced ourselves as the energy weapons hummed to life, their power surging into the rift. The effect was immediate. The rift convulsed, its edges beginning to collapse inwards. A blinding light emanated from its core, growing brighter and more intense. Now, I shouted, through the rift! We sprinted towards the destabilizing portal, the world around us crumbling. The rift was closing, the window to our world shrinking rapidly. Lee was the first to leap through, disappearing into the light. Harrison followed, then Archer. I took one last look at the alien world falling apart, a strange sense of finality washing over me. With a deep breath, I jumped. The sensation was indescribable, a tumult of light and sound, a feeling of being torn apart and reassembled. Then, abruptly, it ended. We emerged on the other side, tumbling onto the familiar ground of our world. The lab was in disarray, scientists and military personnel rushing about in a frenzy. The rift was gone, closed for good. We had done it. Against all odds, we had completed our mission and returned home. As we stood, catching our breath, our commanding officer approached. A look of disbelief mixed with relief on his face. You did it, he said simply. After the tumultuous return through the now-closed rift, our squad was immediately ushered into quarantine. The sterile, white environment of the medical bay was a stark contrast to the chaotic alien landscape we had left behind. Doctors and scientists, clad in protective gear, moved around us running a barrage of tests. We were all exhausted, our bodies and minds pushed to their limits. Yet, there was an undercurrent of unease that couldn't be attributed to just fatigue. Harrison, usually the unflappable one, seemed particularly affected. He was pale, his eyes distant, a slight tremor in his hands. 
Harrison, you good? I asked, watching him closely. He nodded weakly, attempting a reassuring smile. Just tired, I guess. But it was more than just tiredness. As the hours passed, Harrison's condition deteriorated. His skin took on a pallid hue, and he became increasingly delirious, mumbling about shadows and shapes lurking in the corners of his vision. The medical team was baffled. His symptoms didn't align with any known illness. Blood samples were taken, and while we awaited results, Harrison's health rapidly declined. Then, the test results came back. The lead doctor, a stern-faced woman with piercing eyes, approached me. It's an infection. His DNA is being rewritten by a foreign entity. My heart sank. Harrison had contracted something from the parallel world, a virus or entity beyond our understanding. The quarantine was intensified. Harrison was isolated in a containment unit, his condition visible through a thick glass panel. He was barely recognisable now, his body convulsing sporadically, strange growths appearing on his skin. The rest of the squad and I were subjected to further testing, but miraculously, none of us showed signs of infection. It was a small mercy, but it did little to ease the guilt and helplessness we felt watching Harrison suffer. As the medical team scrambled to find a treatment, Harrison's humanity seemed to slip away. The entity inside him was taking over, reshaping him into something else, something alien. Desperate for answers, the scientists turned to the data and samples we had brought back from the parallel world. They worked day and night, trying to understand the nature of the infection and how to combat it. Meanwhile, Harrison containment unit became a site of morbid fascination. He was no longer recognisably human, his body a grotesque display of the alien entity's power. In a race against time, a breakthrough was finally made. The entity was sensitive to a specific frequency of electromagnetic radiation, a vulnerability that could be exploited. A treatment was devised, a risky procedure that involved bombarding Harrison's body with the radiation in an attempt to kill the entity without harming him further. We watched as the procedure was carried out. The containment unit was filled with a blinding light, the air humming with the power of the electromagnetic waves. Slowly, the grotesque growths began to recede, Harrison's convulsions lessening. It was working. When the light finally dimmed, Harrison lay still, his breathing steady. The entity was gone, eradicated by the treatment. But the man who emerged from the containment unit was changed, marked by his ordeal. Harrison's recovery was slow, both physically and psychologically. The experience had left scars, seen and unseen. But he was alive, and that was a miracle in itself. The incident with Harrison had far-reaching implications. It raised questions about the safety of exploring parallel worlds and the unforeseen consequences of such endeavours. But it also provided invaluable insights into the nature of the universe and the limitless possibilities it held. For our squad, it was a sobering experience. We had faced the unknown and returned, but not unscathed. The world beyond the rift was filled with wonders and horrors alike, and we had barely scratched the surface. 